Good, thank you. So maybe we should get started. Um, so guys, welcome to, to, to Friday Grand Rounds. Um, John apologizes that he couldn't make it today. This is probably the first time in a long time that he hasn't made it, so I think he's allowed. But it's my pleasure to introduce our um, faculty supervisor, Dr. Tarani. So Dr. Tarani did her uh, medical training in the UK, including her ophthalmology and a pediatric fellowship uh, at the Princess of Wales Hospital in Birmingham before coming over to the Hospital for Sick Children for a second fellowship in pediatric ophthalmology. Dr. Trani has special interest in the management of diseases of the anterior segment, including cataract, glaucoma, and uveitis, and I think we'll see some of that this morning. And she also has a special interest and expertise in the management of ROP and a research interest in introducing telemedicine in the assessment of ROP. And for her work in this space, she has been recognized with the American Academy of Ophthalmology Achievement Award in 2019. So I think um, we're very privileged to have Dr. Trani, uh, not just in our department, but as our speaker this morning. So th thank you for coming on. And uh, we also have uh, Mike Nguyen and Yogesh Patodia, who are our senior residents who are presenting uh, this morning. So welcome to both Yogesh and Mike. Thanks, Andy. Um, so, uh, and thanks to both residents who've done uh, tremendous work uh, at Sick Kids. I hope everybody who comes through Sick Kids really enjoys their rotation, but they also see a lot of interesting cases. And you'll see as uh, pediatric ophthalmologists, we end up wearing several hats. So uh, depending on sort of your practice, you, as a pediatric ophthalmologist, you can actually be a completely um, comprehensive ophthalmologist and, and be able to uh, manage cases with a variety of subspecialties. So the two cases that we've selected today, um, one is a patient with uveitis and the second one is a patient with glaucoma. So um, I think uh, Mike is going to go first. You're ready, Mike. Does that show up okay? Yep. Perfect. So TB or not TB, that is the question that I'll be hoping to answer this morning for you all. My name is Michael Nguyen. I'm one of the PGY4 residents. And thank you to Dr. Tirwani for this very interesting case that we saw together in clinic just very recently. Uh, my objectives today, which I'm very excited to talk about, are to review a broad differential diagnosis for uveitis, to review different methods of tuberculosis testing, and to review the role of anti-VEGF as an adjunct in uveitis treatment. Here is our case. We have an 11-year-old girl who's referred from the emergency room for a left red eye for the past three weeks. It's associated with photophobia and tearing, and she has no symptoms in the other eye. On our review of systems, she was born in Toronto, but has spent a few months in Bangladesh over the past few years. Otherwise, the ROS was negative. She was otherwise uh, healthy with no significant past ocular history. She was born at term. She's currently in grade six, lives at home with her parents, who are notably Bengali speaking. On our examination, we see that she's 2025 in the right eye and 2050 in the left eye. She does have a trace left RAPD, and her IOP is 12 and 8 in the right and left eyes, respectively. Thanks to the emergency doctor for taking this nice photograph. Uh, this is an external photograph of the child. And looking at the right eye, we see that it looks fairly uh, not inflamed, white sclera and conjunctiva. But your attention is drawn to the left eye with a quite injected and chemotic looking left eye. When we take her to the slit lamp, we see that in the right eye, even though that it did not look quite inflamed, we see that she does have a two plus cell in her anterior chamber. And this is not uncommon in the pediatric population to have anterior segment inflammation with a not injected sclera and conjunctiva. In fact, even in the vitreous in the right eye, we're able to see some anterior vitreous cells as well. Now, obviously in the left eye, we knew that there was quite a bit of injection. Um, there's fine KP inferiorly in the cornea, four plus cell and two plus flare in the anterior chamber without any fibrin. And there's also some posterior synechiae seen as well. In the vitreous, there are also some anterior vitreous cells. These are two dilated fundus photographs of the right and left eyes respectively. Looking at the right eye, you can tell that the media is clear. The optic disc margins are sharp. The RNFL reflex is also crisp and the vessels appear to be quite normal. The macula also looks to be quite flat without any chorioretinal lesions. 
in the left eye, you see that there is some obvious uh, hazing to the picture, which does correspond to about a 0.5 to 1 plus vitritis seen clinically. The optic nerve looks to be quite hyperemic, and your attention is now drawn to the very tortuous and dilated blood vessels um, that are emanating from the optic nerve. And you also see that there is some subtle optic nerve head hemorrhages as well. So this picture really does look like a, a picture of venous stasis. And if you may have not known better that this is a uveitis case, you may have been thinking about something like a CRVO. Looking at the posterior pole, you see that there is some exudates as well scattered throughout the posterior pole. When we look at her OCT nerve, we see that in the left eye, there is quite a thickening of the average RNFL. It's over 200 if you can't see uh, on your screen. And you also note that there is no green, yellow, and red coloring. And this is because that in the pediatric population, the Zeiss does not have any age uh, matched controls. So we'll not be able to tell if there is, uh, if this is within normal limits for this child or not, but obviously you can know that 242 average RNFL is clearly not within normal limits. When we look at her macular thickness OCT on the right eye, it looks to be fairly flat, but the left eye, you can tell that there is certainly thickening of the retina. And if you look more closely at this cut, you see that there is fluid um, uh, that appears to be emanating from the optic nerve head that is kind of leaking uh, nasally to the foveal region. Now, you know, in uveitis, we often come across a lot of questions that we may not have the answers to. So thankfully, we have Dr. Tarani here, who is a uveitis specialist, and I came up with a list of questions that I thought a comprehensive ophthalmologist and or resident would like to know about. And the first question I came up with is that, is it still classified as anterior uveitis if there's optic disc edema? Is it no, this child has panuveitis? No, this child has posterior uveitis with secondary anterior spillover. Yes, this child has anterior uveitis with secondary optic disc edema. Or no, this child has intermediate uveitis with secondary anterior spillover and optic disc edema. Thanks, Mike. We'll just give it a second or two to run um, before we get the results and they're starting to come in now. I think you have the audience fairly split and I'll show you what you got here. Hmm. That's great. Good points. All right. So half people think anterior uveitis and half people think pan uveitis. Some people think intermediate uveitis. All right. So for us, we thought that this child has anterior uveitis with secondary optic disc edema. Now, why do we think this? Well, there is a classification system for uveitis from the SUN criteria or the standardization of uveitis nomenclature, which was a paper published in 2005 that helped to classify uveitis based on the um, uh, anatomical classification. So when we think of anterior uveitis, it refers to the primary site of inflammation being in the anterior chamber. Correspondingly, intermediate is with the vitreous, posterior is with the retina or choroid, and panuveitis refers to significant amount of inflammation in both the anterior, sorry, in the anterior chamber, the vitreous, and the retina or choroid. When more than one ocular structure is involved, the convention is that the primary site of inflammation is named first, and then if there, are, if there is a severe anterior uveitis that may produce secondary structural complications, such as optic disc edema, then we add that on as a modifier. So for example, anterior uveitis with secondary optic disc edema. The next question I had, which is not a poll question, is, you know, is it common for optic disc edema to be secondary to anterior uveitis? In the adult population, when we see a lot of patients with uveitis, I, we don't often see a lot of optic disc edema. And in fact, the literature is kind of uh, very sparse, but it shows that the incidence is about 1.8 to 22%. So quite a large range, but most of the reports I found were in the lower range of that. Um, but for the pediatric population, interestingly, this journal, uh, this paper published in the British Journal of Ophthalmology uh, looked at optic disc edema in a tertiary center um, for uveitis. And they found that in 30% of patients who were referred for uveitis, they had optic disc edema. And of these 36 out of 123 patients, 12 of them, a third of the patients with optic disc edema were uh, from anterior uveitis. So certainly the take home message for this slide is that optic disc edema, secondary to anterior uveitis can be much more common in a pediatric population than we may be used to in the adult population. Now that we've kind of gathered that, you know, this is not a typical one of the male patients who just has anterior uveitis in our clinic and we can just send them on their way. We need to have a broad differential diagnosis for any uveitis. This is also not a poll question, 
but we need to have some kind of framework for thinking about uveitis. Oftentimes we don't have to because they're so idiopathic and so self-resolving, but we know that uveitis can cause a lot of vision threatening and life threatening causes. So we need to have a framework. And this is also very uh, good test fodder for residents on oral examinations. Um, for me, this is a framework that I have that's courtesy of Dr. Ephraim Manokorn. There's a lot of um, letters and things that I will hopefully go through. So if you just pay attention now, um, I'll hopefully give you a strong framework for thinking about uh, vision threatening and life threatening causes. And just a disclaimer, this is obviously not a comprehensive list, but this certainly hits a lot of the points. So for quote unquote, any uveitis, you do want to think about these conditions. Now, the first thing you need to remember is SLT. And SLT is very easy because we all in the adult world do SLT for adult patients with glaucoma, very common laser that we perform. So when you think of SSS, you should think of sarcoid, syphilis, and sympathetic ophthalmia. LL is for leukemia and lymphoma. TTT stands for toxoplasmosis, toxocara, and tuberculosis. When you think of sympathetic ophthalmia, you need to then think of its counterpart, avoid Koyanagi Harada disease, VKH. The V in VKH makes you then think about the viral causes that can cause very severe uveitis, such as CMV, herpes simplex, and varicella zoster. Of course, you don't want to forget about the vasculitis, uh, the vasculitides that can cause uveitis, and these include eels, multiple sclerosis, pars planitis, and bechettes, obviously among others. To remember these four, you have to remember EMPD, which is not really memorable until you remember that Ephraim Mandelkorn loves peanut butter, EMPB. So that's how you remember the four main causes of vasculitis for uveitis. And then finally, there are also the white dot syndromes of which there are three large and three small. And the three large ones are ampi, serpiginous, and birdshots. And the small ones are mudes, pick, and multifocal choroiditis and panuveitis. Okay, that was a lot. And um, you know, this is not by any means comprehensive, but this will certainly hit most of the vision threatening and life threatening causes of uveitis. And I'd also, you know, would be remiss to not mention the pediatric causes that you should also think about in a pediatric population. And that also includes JIA and TINU. All right, now that we have that out of the way and I've hit my first objective, we can move on to what we think about this child. So we know that this child, just as a reminder, she has a right eye anterior uveitis with some anterior vitreous spillover. Her left eye has a much more severe anterior uveitis with secondary optic disc edema. The treatment at this point is nothing mind blowing. It's the usual stuff that we always do. Predfort, Q1, Maxidex ointment at night, Cyclogil, BID, left eye to help with that posterior synechiae. We also want to send for a full uveitis panel workup. And of course, we want to order an IVFA. And why do we want to order an IVFA? Well, because we remember that the vessels were very tortuous. They looked absolutely abnormal. And we know that there probably is an underlying retinal problem going on that we need to assess further with an IVFA. So in these cases, when it appears that the fundus is very much involved, it's very crucial to get an IVFA to further suss out what's going on. And remember that uveitis diagnoses can be in evolution just because right now we think it's an anterior uveitis. That doesn't mean that further on, once we get more evidence, we may change what we have classified this child's uveitis to becoming. A question that often comes up is what is a full uveitis panel workup? Now this depends from practitioner to practitioner, from center to center, but at SickKids, this is the basic full uveitis panel that we order on children who presents with uveitis. And interestingly, we came up with this list with collaboration from our rheumatology colleagues who often play a very large role in co-managing our patients. Often pediatric patients, unlike the adult populations, will go on to requiring long-term immunosuppression um, and we also need to co-manage. So they like to have some other blood work um, in our initial workup. So this is what we send off for. Now, obviously when children have certain clinical features that might suggest various things, we'll also send off a more pointed um, testing. So if, for example, they had a macular star, we might also send off for uh, Bartonella, for example. And these are some of the examples that we would give, but in general, we always send this off for every patient that comes through. So now, you know, we send off for this panel workup. We're going to see her back again in a week for the IVFA. We'll see how the topical steroid drops do. And, you know, she comes back a week later and, you know, she says she feels more blurry. And on close questioning, and it's so important to do this, she was found to not be taking her drops properly. She was actually taking Cyclogil every two hours, Predfort only twice a day, and was not even using the ointment at all. 
So it's very important to really ask our patients every time they come in, what exactly are you doing with their drops? You know, three drops is not an insignificant amount, especially for a small 11 year old and for a mom that may not speak uh, very good English to be able to understand. And that was a bit of an oversight in our point. We have then obviously then gotten a Bengali translator with every subsequent visit for um, our child. But her vision clearly here is getting worse and we need to figure out, is this because of medication non-adherence or is there something else going on? Looking at the macular change OCT, we see that there is certainly worsening now of her um, of the fluid emanating from the optic nerve. And we kind of see that there's also a subfoveal neurosensory retinal detachment that is developing as well. When we get the IVFA, and remember how important it is to get this, uh, these are two representative recirculation phase photos from the right and left eyes respectively. In the right eye, we see that there is no extra areas of hyperfluorescence or hypofluorescence. The optic disc margin appears to be sharp and everything looks fairly normal in this right eye. Now, when we look at the left eye, you can clearly see that there are multiple, multiple areas of hyperfluorescence scattered throughout the retina, thought to be representative of leakage. You also see that there is leakage emanating from the optic nerve head, excuse me. And we see that there is some hypofluorescence, if you look carefully, right next to the optic nerve head, which is probably related to blocking from the optic nerve head edema. On further um, photos, looking at the periphery, you can see that this leakage is even present temporally, inferiorly, and superiorly as well. So there is certainly a lot of leakage and probably a lot of vasculitis that is going on, which just goes to show how important it is to get IVFA um, in these cases. When we order the full panel workup, this is what came back. Um, most of the time, you know, we send these back and it's always negative, and you know, we're like, okay, idiopathic, carry on. Uh, but this time, some stuff actually came back. First, the ANA came back, but it's very weakly positive. One out of 80 dilution. One out of 40 is just barely the cutoff. One out of 80 is barely positive. Nothing that any rheumatologist would get very excited about for sure. But more interestingly, you scan through your results and you see that the quantiferon gold is positive. It says here, look, quantiferon TB, positive. M tuberculosis, infection likely. Your eyes light up. You're like, wow, we caught a case of TB. You look through the rest of the quantiferon stuff, you see here a TB1 antigen minus nil 0.01. There's no reference values. You don't really understand what this means. So you kind of disregard it, but you look at the positive result and you think, hmm, this is positive. That's right. So what would be your next step now? So we can pull up this poll here. If you just take a read through, would you want to start oral prednisone to start immunosuppressing the vasculitis? Would you perform a subtenon steroid injection to help control the macular edema? Would you can counsel on the importance of topical steroid drops? Maybe this is all related to non-adherence due to lack of communication. Uh, or would you want to refer now to infectious disease? That is a freebie. So that is obviously the correct answer. We want to refer to infectious disease. And thankfully, they are very good at getting back to us. They write a very long note. This is just their impression and plan. And I'm going to read through it here. And remember, we're trying to ask the question, is it TB? or not TB, you scan through the impression, you start reading, quantiferon result is curious because only one of the TB antigens is positive. The TB2 antigen that was positive is thought to be representative of a CD8 T cell. Your eyes start glazing over. So you scan down here and you get to the plan. Okay, this is what is important. AC tap, they want us to do an AC tap. Okay, that's doable. Please repeat quantiferon. Okay, we can do that. And now you also read here that if we were planning on starting systemic steroids or intraocular steroids, they want to initiate anti-tuberculosis treatment. They want to start her, this 11-year-old girl who, by the way, also has no systemic symptoms, negative chest x-ray, no contact of TB on a six-month course of INH, rifampin, and pyrazinamide. Certainly not something insignificant. So now you're thinking, you know, this is a lot. This is probably something quite serious now. And I should probably understand what the first preamble paragraph was about. What actually happens when we're ordering quantiferon gold? And to understand this, we need to go back to its much older counterpart, the TB skin test. Now, this is a slide from medical school. And, uh, you know, the TB skin test has been around for a very long time. It's been around for over 100 years. And this TB skin test also goes by Manteau test or the purified protein derivative is a fairly simple test. What happens is that the purified protein derivative derived from mycobacterium tuberculosis is going to be injected intradermally into your skin. 
and that it produces a little bubble, which is why it's uh, uh, injected intradermally. There, after 48 to 72 hours, we have resident macrophages that go up and gobble up this protein. And once they do, they are going to hang around for a bit while they wait for memory T cells, CD4 T cells to come floating by. As a reminder, CD4 T cells, the memory T cells are like the sentinels for the adaptive immune system. Remember, we have an innate and adaptive immune system. The adaptive immune system is the one that is for long-term immunity. So these memory T cells will float by and they'll check. They'll be like, hmm, have I seen this antigen before? And if you've never had a prior TB exposure, they'll say, nope, I've never seen this before. Carry on, no need for any inflammation. So there is no inflammation. It is a flat, not indurated skin. However, if you've had a prior TB exposure or if you've had the BCG vaccine, then what happens is that the macrophage that has been gobbling up the uh, TB protein is going to present it to this memory T cell, the CD4 T cell that floats by. And the CD4 T cell says, hey, wait a minute. I have seen this before when you had that TB infection. I'm going to start secreting a lot of chemokines, such as interferon gamma, and recruits a bunch of macrophages and T cells to come gobble up and uh, 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 incite an immune response. And that is why we have this induration in the skin, which is what we actually measure if you have a positive TB test. Now, quantiferon gold, in contrast, is, not, is, is a very similar uh, reaction, but it happens inside a blood vial. So it is an in vitro test for TB. We take blood sample from the patient, and then in the, the vials, there are TB peptides. These TB peptides, are very specific only for TB. So they will not cross-react with a prior BCG vaccination. When your blood uh, macrophages gobble up these uh, peptides and present it to the same memory T cells, the CD4 T cells, if there has been a prior exposure, there will be release of interferon gamma. So now that we have a basic understanding of quantiferon gold, I'm gonna help you interpret what we had initially glanced over. So when we order quantiferon gold, there is gonna be four vials of blood that are taken. Each vial is different. The first vial is called the mitogen, or that is the positive control. Mitogen is a hemagglutinin that is going to incite an immune response in any person who is immunocompetent. So when we look at our child, the mitogen is very positive, okay? Greater than 10 clearly means that there is an immunocompetent uh, patient here. We have the nil vial. The nil vial is basically nothing. It is, to, it is a negative control that is to adjust for background levels of interferon gamma. So that should be very close to zero. And indeed, in our child, it is. So we want to check the positive control is good. The negative control is good. Now we can interpret the TB uh, antigens. There is two of them, TB1 and TB2. That's what our ID doctors were talking to us about. The TB1 response is the one that detects the CD4 T cell. Remember, CD4 T cells are the memory T cells, these are the sentinels of the adaptive immune system. They are gonna be the ones to be first alerted if we've had a previous exposure. And the TB2 is optimized for detection of mainly the CD8. And if you remember, CD8 are the cytotoxic T cells. These are the killers. These are the ones that get activated once CD4 says, hey, I'm gonna secrete some interferon gamma because I see this infection. CD8 T cell comes in and says, okay, I'm gonna kill now because you said that we've seen this before and this is bad. So that is what the CD8 T cell does. Now, if we interpret our child's results, it actually doesn't make a lot of sense because the TB1 vial, which is the memory T cells, the CD4 is actually negative, whereas this TB2 is positive. And that's why the ID doctors said it was curious because how could the, uh, the adaptive immune system not have their sentinels recognize this, but somehow have the cytotoxic T cells be activated to kill this uh, TB peptide. So that should be a first sign that maybe there's something that's not correct in our interpretation. Now we look at the accuracy of quantiferon gold um, and we see that actually it is quite accurate. 97% specificity, 94% sensitivity, much better than the TB skin test. But remember, it's not 100%. And that is a very important part to think about. Whenever we order a test, just because we order it and it has a very accurate um, markers, it does not mean that it is gonna be perfect. Now that you know about the differences between quantiferon gold and TB skin test, you might think to yourself, when should I order quantiferon gold? Well, as per the Canadian tuberculosis standards, which is this guideline set by various societies that treat TB, they recommend it in two patient populations, 
people who have received BCG as a vaccine because of risk of false positives and people from groups that historically have poor rates of return. So if you don't think they're going to come back for their second visit, you should probably order a quantiferin gold because remember, this is a two day affair, the TB skin test. You need to come get your, the wheel and then you have to come back two to three days later to get it interpreted. It's a lot of work and not many of our patients are able to take two days out of their lives to get this testing done. Why don't we just order quantiferin gold for everyone? Well, unfortunately in Ontario, it's not publicly funded. And as from my understanding, there are only three or four places in the GTA area that even do quantiferin gold. And even then the patients will have to often pay out of pocket and it's gonna be, I think over a hundred dollars. So not an insignificant amount for our patients. So we've ordered now the repeat quantiferin gold and we see for her, we can interpret it together. We don't even need to look at the negative results. So we look at the mitogen, false positive, uh, sorry, the positive control, very positive, that's good. The nil, the negative control, close to zero, also good. Now that the two control markers are good, we know that the TB1 and TB2 antigens are gonna be interpretable and they're zero. So now we have concluded here that this patient likely does not have TB, we think. Um, now, just because we have managed to figure out that this patient does not have TB, that doesn't mean their uveitis is getting any better. And in fact, it is getting worse. The fluid that's emanating from the optic nerve is getting worse. The subfovial neurosensory renal detachment is getting worse. And you can see day by day from her first visit to subsequent weeks, it's been getting worse and worse. So at this point, what would you do next? If we can pull up this poll here. We're going to perform an AC tap because ID recommended it. And we think that it would be a reasonable idea in this child to get to see if we can culture TB. But what would you do for the uveitis? Oral steroids, subtenon, anti-VEGF, anti-VEGF and oral steroids. I'm going to give that a few more seconds to run. Mike, I just wanted to give you a heads up that your mouse is not tracking um, completely with the images. Okay. Um, so maybe don't use it because it's not matching what I think you intend to do. Uh, okay, thank you. Oh, well, very nice split. That's great. So what we decided to do was to perform an AC tap and then perform anti-VEGF in the left eye and also start oral prednisone at one milligram per kilogram. I'll get into this very shortly, but my other question is, would you also cover with anti-TB medications? Pull here. Given that this child has had one positive result, one negative result. I'm gonna give that a couple more seconds. Votes are still coming in. And as that's running, Aaron asks, what's the sensitivity and specificity of quantiferin gold? If you just wanna cover that again. Yeah, it is 97% specific and 94% sensitive compared to uh, high 80s for the TB skin test. Okay, so two thirds of people say no. Okay, interesting. We uh, decided no as well, because we thought that since the quantiferin gold was negative, the repeat, the patient has low risk factors. Uh, you know, she has no contact, she's asymptomatic, her chest x-ray is negative, and the uveitis does not appear to look like tuberculosis, we decided to not cover as well. So let's get to the question of why did we decide on anti-VEGF and oral steroids for this patient? Uh, this looks like a, a poll, but it's not. Uh, the answer is all of the above. Um, the main reason why we decided to do anti-VEGF as an adjunct in this patient is really because of that component of venous stasis. I was stressing that you know the vessels are very tortuous. The optic nerve head is a bit swollen. There is optic nerve head hemorrhages. Really, this picture um, could have been something like a CRVO. Obviously, it's not, but that is kind of the picture that really was standing out to us. And anti-VEGF can be very beneficial in those cases. And certainly there's been a lot of, of evidence to show that anti-VEGF is a good adjunct uh, in these cases. Even for cases of uveitic macular edema that's refractory to other treatments, uh, there are people that have been doing anti-VEGF and there are a lot of case series to show that it can be effective. But for us, a large component was because of that venous stasis. We also wanted to balance the fact that, you know, she could have an IOP spike and she does have a history of medication non-adherence. And we don't want to risk that in a child who is already predisposed to be developing glaucoma down the road because of her uveitis. We don't want to give her, her uh, optic nerve head any more stress. We want to also 
uh, you know, talk about the very remote risk of an actual infectious etiology. A third of the audience did think that they still wanted to cover with TB medications. So clearly injecting steroids into the eye probably is not the best if there was still that remote risk of TB. And finally, we also wanted to do anti-VEGF and oral steroids because of the need to suppress her immune system. The anti-VEGF is not gonna treat her uveitis. We need to have some uh, immunosuppressives on board to quickly treat the pan-uveitis. We bring her back in five days to see how she's doing. And amazingly, her vision is improving to kind of her first presentation. The AC tap, as you may expect, is negative, you know, with a, um, a negative uh, uh, acid fast bacilli. And we also sent off for viruses as well, given the picture of vasculitis, which also came back negative. And I wanted to show you this picture of the before and after. Again, look at this component of venous stasis with the vessel tortuosity and how much that improved pre-Avastin compared to post-Avastin, where the vessels are much less tortuous, the optic nerve head looks less swollen, and um, uh, overall, this picture looks much better. She's incidentally also developing what looks like a macular star, but this is probably just incidental because we've already sent off for Bartonella, and that was negative. Looking at the macular change OCT, it's been improving. So here in the red arrow, at the bottom, which shows where she got the injection and when she started the oral prednisone five days later, there's already a dramatic improvement. One week later, there's a further improvement. And one month later, there is a great improvement and there's only a tiny amount of subretinal fluid remaining. So I guess to answer the question of, you know, is it TB or not TB? And um, infectious disease, they don't think so. They thought that given the negative quantifier on results and the absence of a known contact, they don't think it's related to TB. How about that weekly positive ANA? Did rheumatology get excited about that? Uh, they did not. They thought that she did not have any signs or symptoms or blood work consistent with an underlying rheumatic condition. So as of now, our last visit with the child was a week ago, and we thought that she has an idiopathic anterior uveitis in the right eye and an idiopathic pan-uveitis now in the left eye. We're gonna be tapering her oral steroids and topical steroids, and we're going to be starting her on weekly methotrexate subcutaneous injections. This is a bit different than what we may do in the adult world. Children who often need to be on steroids for you know, a long period of time, i.e. longer than six weeks, we often also start them on methotrexate because methotrexate takes up to 12 weeks to get into effect. And we know that these children will need to have some sort of long-term immunosuppression to do well. This is a bit beyond the scope of this talk, so I'll I move on, but just recognize that in the pediatric world, it is not as simple as just tapering steroids off. Um, thank you for listening. The objectives again today were to review a broad differential diagnosis of uveitis, including life-threatening and infectious etiologies, to review different methods of tuberculosis testing, which is TB skin testing and quantifurin gold, and to review the role of anti-VEGF as an adjunct in uveitis treatment. My take-home messages are to always perform a dilated fundus exam to rule out life-threatening and infection causes. Order quantifurin gold instead of TB skin testing in patients who've had prior BCG vaccine or if you think they're unlikely to return for skin test reading. And finally, anti-VEGF is an option for treatment in uveitis, especially when there's evidence of venous stasis causing macular edema, concern for IOP spikes, and possible infections that may preclude intraocular or depot steroids. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. That was an excellent uh, discussion and an amazing review of quantifier and gold. I don't think I've ever seen it explained that well. So, so thank you for that. Um, just a question that I have, because there was all that uncertainty about TB. Does she have a travel history or was she born elsewhere? Or was, she, was this girl born in Canada? I missed that part. That's okay. She was born in Toronto, but she has visited Bangladesh uh, a few months at a time over the past few years, most recently two years ago. Um, so there certainly could be a travel history, but there's no contact. And really, ID always stresses that there really has to be some sort of positive contact recently in order for them to really entertain the, the diagnosis of, of TB. Obviously, recently, in with like a chest X-ray and, yeah. uh, you know, symptoms and all that. But recently, meaning probably not more like not uh, like her last visit was two years ago. And for okay. them, they felt it was too remote. All right. Thank you. A uh, question from the audience, um, whether she had had the COVID vaccination recently. That is a good question. I do not know that if she's had um, the COVID vaccine. I think, I think she had had a COVID vaccination. <clears throat> and I don't know that that's uh, something that we can actually kind of say whether there's um, contributory to developing uveitis because, um, you know, that's 
I, I don't think that answer is definitively known yet. Um, but there wasn't anything further that we could do on investigations to figure out if this is um, in any way related to vaccination. Um, but we, we thought that, you know, if we're going to send um, material from the ACTAP, is there anything that we could actually look for? And I think, uh, and I, I, and I want to thank Crystal Chung and actually Ashwin Madhupadna, who uh, looked after this child a little bit over the Christmas period as well, because she presented on Christmas Eve, in fact. Um, we sort of discussed that as well. We thought, well, there's not really anything else that you could um, uh, ascertain from uh, investigations, whether this is contributory or not. But she had had a COVID vaccine, I think. Perfect. Thank you. So maybe we can uh, move on to, to Yogesh's presentation. Thanks very much, uh, very much, Michael. That was a great presentation. Excellent. Uh, so we can see my slides here. Yes. Wonderful. Okay. Well, uh, good morning, everyone. Um, again, my name is Yogesh Patodi. If anyone doesn't know me, I'm one of the PGY4 residents. Uh, and today we're going to chat a little bit about a uh, case about what to do with an opaque cornea. Um, so again, I'd like to thank Dr. Tarani for spending the time to uh, help me build this case and this presentation. Uh, and uh, hopefully there'll be some interesting curls that uh, we'll kind of chat about. Um, so before we get into it, we'll talk a little bit about the objectives. And if anyone has seen Shit's Creek, um, we're going to put our pediatric hats back on and we're going to be talking about some bebés today. So, um, you know, the key things that we would like to talk about is identifying the clinical features of congenital glaucoma, comparing and contrast the difference between other corneal diseases or corneal dystrophies and congenital glaucoma, such as CHED. Uh, and finally, identifying any surgical management um, for congenital glaucoma and some of the long-term sequelae that may occur. Uh, so I'll put up our first poll question here um, and uh, we get right into it. Essentially, the question we're asking here is what is included in the differential uh, for a, a congenital um, corneal opacity? Uh, you know, is it scleral cornea, tears and decimase membrane, ulcers, metabolic disorders such as mucopolysaccharidosis or cystinosis, tyrosinemia? Um, Peter's anomaly, various edemas of the cornea, whether that be uh, corneal dystrophies, congenital glaucoma, dermoids, or all of the above. Yo, guys, I think the residents in the crowd are wishing that all exam questions were this easy. I know. <laughs> <laughs> my, my questions are my my questions are pretty gimmies today. So um, yeah, so it's, this is exactly it. Majority, it looks like basically everyone got it right. Again, all of the above is in fact included. The mnemonic that everyone should know, especially for our oral exams, is the uh, the mnemonic stumped. So I, hopefully my uh, my cursor is kind of it, it's highlighting properly. But S T U M P E D is the uh, the way to remember that differential diagnosis. So let's get right into our case. Um, you know we have baby A A over here, and interestingly enough, mother called sick kids um, and said, you know this baby is about seven days old. And the mother called uh, called sick kid saying, hey, my child has cloudy corneas in both eyes. And she recognized this because her older child had a similar presentation around the same time. Uh, and so what I kind of want to briefly do here is just chat about kind of what we're seeing here on the exam. Again, the left and right eye, the right and left eye. The key findings that we see is that there's an enlarged cornea, again, a small amount of scleral show on each side. The corneal edema is not only in the center of the cornea, but it is also extending out to the periphery. And finally, the corneal light reflex that we're able to appreciate here does show that there's some epitheliopathy or there may be some epithelial edema that's also uh, involved here. So going back to our differential diagnosis, let's kind of look at what this might be related to or what we might see here. So I put up a bunch of pictures here of kind of the stumped uh, differential diagnosis, again, from the top left going over here, we have scleral cornea, we have uh, tears and decimase membrane or trauma, um, corneal ulcers, metabolic disorders such as cystinosis, Peter's anomaly, the edema, uh, again, which is the congenital dystrophies, corneal dystrophies, um, or congenital glaucoma, and then dermoids. So again, kind of looking at all of these pictures, again, these are just examples, but um, the one that kind of closely relates is likely the edema family. And so, you know, here's our case. Here's uh, interestingly, this is enough, uh, a case of CHED. Um, and you can see they're slightly related. So let's kind of compare and contrast the two uh, to see if we can tease out, you know, what the difference is or where, what it could be. Um, so congenital glaucoma, just briefly chatting about it here, um, can be a sporadic disease. Uh, however, about 10 to 40% can be autosomal recessive as well. And again, for our OCAP exams, thing to remember, it's uh, on the CYP1B1 gene, so something to keep in mind. 
And one of the major risk factors is obviously consanguinity and affected siblings. So again, given the fact that it's an autosomal recessive disease, the inheritance risk is 25% um, that the child may get it if uh, the first child has it. Now, if we look at CHED, uh, there used to be an old classification of CHED1 and CHED2 um, that's been newly classified now. CHED1 is now considered one of the PPMDs or posterior polymorphous dystrophies, coronal dystrophies. Uh, and CHED2 is now considered the autosomal recessive form. So again, that's the now CHED disease. Um, it's on this specific gene, SLC4A11 gene. Again, something to remember for OCAPs. Uh, and one of the key, uh, you know, given the fact that it's autosomal recessive, uh, consanguinity and affected siblings are, um, again, the biggest risk factors. Uh, again, looking at the presentations, they both look to uh, present relatively the same. You know, um, they both have bilateral corneal opacity. Uh, congenital glaucoma can present with epiphora, photophobia, blepharospasm, and both can present with a sensory nystagmus. When we tease them out a little bit more, one of the classic findings that you find it, or that you see in shed is uh, the decimase membrane has this beaten bronze appearance. So something to note. Now, obviously the, one of the biggest differences between the two comes down to the intraocular pressure. So congenital glaucoma typically has an elevated intraocular pressure, usually in the twenties or thirties. Um, uh, and again, in young kids, that's extremely high. Uh, however, in shed, it is typically normal or it can be falsely elevated due to the edema. Now, both present with an increased uh, central corneal thickness. Um, however, the key thing in congenital glaucoma is the axial length is typically longer on the higher end of normal. So again, for a one month old, uh, the literature suggests that the axial lengths are typically anywhere from 17 to 20 uh, millimeters. In practice, I think it seemed to be more closer to 17 to 18 millimeters. Um, so again, an enlarged axial length is more suggestive of congenital glaucoma. Finally, Treatment is obviously the most important thing. Early detection is key in both cases. And for CHED, um, doing various types of uh, corneal procedures such as uh, penetrating keratoplasty versus endothelial keratoplasty is, is uh, an important mainstay in um, kind of resolving uh, the edema. And the surgical interventions for glaucoma, we'll, for congenital glaucoma, we'll try and uh, we'll chat about and tease out in a little bit. Again, the risk or the goal here um, is actually to prevent amblyopia. We do not want amblyopia in this kid. So coming back and circling back to our little kid here, baby AA, uh, we start to, you know, we ask questions, what are the things we want to know now and differentiate between CHED versus congenital glaucoma? Obviously, we mentioned the IOP is important, but looking at the nerve, getting some baseline function or baseline testing is important. So as we see here with our kid, the vision was blinked to light in both eyes, and the intraocular pressure was 48 in the right and 46 in the left. And the fundus was unfortunately not visualized because the corneal edema was too far. It, it was too much corneal edema uh, in order to properly visualize. Um, so as you can see, the case does resemble a little bit to CHED, but given that the clinical picture as well as the increased ocular pressure is there, um, you know, this is more than likely keeping in keeping with congenital glaucoma uh, and, and EUA and surgical intervention uh, that is needed uh, right away. And so this patient was booked for that, but medical management is typically started in the interim. And so this brings us on to our second poll question here. Um, what medications are contraindicated in this infant in specific? Um, Jokic, so, I'm going to interrupt you for one second. Yep. I don't have your other poll questions, so I'll, just, I'll ask the audience to think in okay. their heads what they would do as you read this out for the rest uh, of the poll questions. I don't have them, unfortunately. Oh, okay, cool. <laughs> um, so yeah, so again, uh, alpha agonists, are they contraindicated? Beta blockers, carbonic anhydrase inhibitors, um, oral diamox, or prostaglan analogs. Um, and I don't know if anyone wrote in the chat or not, but this is, again, a very um, important point to, to hit home uh, in a pediatric practice, especially in young kiddos like this. Alpha agonists should never be prescribed. Uh, and again, they're linked with um, uh, CNS depression and death. And therefore, like I said, alpha gan, iopidine, the most important point, they can never be prescribed in these kids. Um, so in our case, our little kiddo here was uh, started on Betaxol, which is a selective beta blocker at its lowest concentration, found to be very effective uh, in this uh, population. Latanoprost as well as a safe and effective medication to use. Brinzolamide was started, interestingly enough, has a, um, a side effect where it inhibits the endothelial pumps and actually can inhibit or prevent the clearing of the, the um, corneal edema but it has a very good IOP lowering capability. And so it started and used uh, to try and clear the cornea as much as possible. Again, Dimox, we all know, has some of the side effects, both GI issues as well as um, uh, potassium imbalances or, or electrolyte imbalances. Um, and then this patient was booked for an EUA and surgery kind of within a week. 
Uh, and again, all of the medications that both topical and oral medications started mainly to clear the cornea up for surgery and for the EUA. So jumping straight into our EUA here, uh, kind of the uh, key features that I want to chat about, again, the cornea still cloudy. Unfortunately, the medications weren't, you know, given for a few days, weren't enough to clear the corneas uh, completely. Um, the corneal diameters here were measured almost at 13 millimeters in both eyes. And again, the cutoff that we kind of look for is if the cornea is under 11 millimeters, that's typically normal. At 11 millimeters or just above 11 millimeters, we start getting a little bit suspicious. So what's going on? And above 12 is pathologic. And again, you can get enlarged corneal diameters in CHED as well. But again, this is, um, you know, anything above 12, we're concerned about. We jump down over to the, the, the CC here, the pachymetry. And again, we see both uh, to be over a thousand microns in, in both eyes. And again, this is similar to kind of what we see in, uh, in CHED as well, too, or the congenital uh, corneal dystrophies. But again, we jump to the- So, um, Yogi, I just wanted to sort of uh, jump in there. In, in CHED, generally the corneal diameter is not enlarged. Oh, sorry, so, yes. So that would be, so yeah, I just, I think that was- Oh, just, yeah, I think I, yeah. <laughs> Okay, just because that was a question in the um, in the chat as well. So that's another differential between CHED and uh, congenital glaucoma. Okay. Thanks, Dr. Randy. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, so again, uh, the intraocular pressure, again, was the key finding that we see here, again, 40s. And as I mentioned earlier, typically in, uh, in congenital glaucoma, the intraocular pressure um, is, you know, usually in the 20s and 30s. When we find it here in the 40s, we see that this is more than likely in keeping with a very severe phenotype. So something to note down the road, uh, as well as when we chat a little bit about the brother. And then finally, we get an axial length measurement. This is a good baseline measure because in subsequent follow-ups, we want to measure and monitor the, um, the axial lengths. And so again, that's going to be uh, one of the things that we'll chat about um, in a little bit as well. So let's talk about some of the surgical options that we have. So again, uh, congenital glaucoma, the, um, uh, the uh, pathology is actually linked to the angle and it's all within the angle. It's typically thought that it's failure of maturation of the angle structures themselves. So angle surgery is the primary and mainstay treatment. Uh, historically, what was previously done, and I've got some images on the side here, um, was a goniotomy. You could use either a blade or 25 gauge sharp needle. Uh, and it was used to essentially incise and cause a um, opening in the inner wall of Shum's canal. Now, typically up to 120 degrees was treated uh, in this case. Now, moving forward kind of through history, um, uh, a trabeculotomy is also uh, installed as a treatment. And again, it's using this uh, instrument called the Harms trabeculotome, um, again, placed within the Schlem's canal and an incision of the um, inner wall of Schlem's canal was opened up. And again, approximately 120 degrees was treated because the um, rigidity of this, uh, of this instrument, you're unable to actually treat 360. Something that's more commonly done now, or, or that's a, a newer technique, is the goniotomy assisted transluminal trabeculotomy. So, again, a little uh, schematic diagram here. It's a 360 treatment of uh, either an ab internal or ab external approach. Um, and again, 360, uh, the 360 degrees of the internal wall is incised or opened up. Uh, and again, it provides theoretically a, um, a, a better opportunity for outflow and decreased resistance, given the fact that the entire um, inner wall of Shum's canal is opened up. Now, uh, if angle surgery fails, then trabecular bypass surgery is always an option. And again, we see things like Ahmed uh, glaucoma valves, bare valve tube shunts, um, trabeculotomies, and again, CPC or, or cycle photocoagulation is always an option as well. Um, and these are sort of secondary surgeries that can occur after, um, after the angle surgeries. So what we'll do is uh, I wanted to show a quick video of kind of an ab external eye tract trabeculotomy, uh, an example of what was done in this case, but it was not the actual case that we saw uh, to, uh, that was actually uh, done. Um, let's just see if we can share it here. Perfect. Uh, so everyone hopefully can see the video there. Um, of note, uh, I want to mention that an ab internal approach is always preferred, uh, given the fact that an ab external approach does cut into conge and sclera. And given the fact that these patients will likely have multiple follow-ups down the road, they'll require, um, uh, they'll require to have, you know, good real estate. So, um, you know, making sure that we can do an ab internal approach is is great is important, but if the corneal opacity is too much, then we're unable to um, get proper visualization. And so an ab external approach needs to be done. Um, so as we can see here in the video, a uh, conjunctival peridomy is created and a uh, partial thickness scleral flap, much like a trabeculectomy uh, is completed. 
it basically we make this partial thickness flap all the way up to the scleral spur and you can see the surgeon is continuing to do that once you reach the scleral spur it's pretty basically we're at the roof of the schlem's canal and a radial incision is made um, into the roof of schlem's canal to kind of open it up now they use an instrument here to kind of cannulate Shum's canal and open it up to make sure that they're in the correct position. And once this is done, uh, the surgeon decides to bring the pupil down with some myocol. And again, this is important given the fact that you're using, um, you know, you're using uh, something in size 360. You want to protect the lens as much as possible, and this is done in pediatric cases as well. So here's the eye track probe um, being sent 360 around Schlem's canal. Again, it's cannulating Schlem's canal um, and moving its way around until it's finally uh, externalized out of the incision that was primarily made. And we see that here. And then once that's completed, both ends of the eye track cannula are uh, grasped with some forceps. And you'll see the sort of zipper effect of it opening and completely releasing uh, the internal wall of Schlem's canal. So again, at this point, again, same thing, um, your uh, radial incision is closed, the conjunctiva is, uh, the uh, scleral flap is closed, and the conjunctiva is closed as well. So Yogi, this is really interesting because that's a, that's a great um, video. I'm just intrigued as to why that person had um, ab external because the cornea was perfectly clear. You could the cornea was clear. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good point. <laughs> Um, so our little kiddo here at post-op week one, um, the corneas were noted to continue to clear and the IOPs were about 30 to finger touch. But again, about a week later, so looking at our actual exam here, key findings that I want to show is that the corneal opacity does appear to be improving in both eyes. Uh, there does appear to be some posterior synechia on the lens, and this may be related to the inflammatory nature of the surgery itself. But again, we're finally able to get a good view posteriorly into the fundus and get an accurate measurement or an accurate look at what the cup to disc ratio is. So moving to post-op month one, um, we compare kind of the initial presentation to post-op month one now, and we can see that the pachymetry changes uh, of over a thousand have dropped to the mid 800s. The intraocular pressure has improved from 40s down to the mid to low 20s, and the cupping has improved from 0.8 to roughly about 0.6. And again, the cupping that we see in, in congenital glaucoma, especially early on when the intraocular pressure is high, is mainly due to a mechanical process. Again, high IOP pushes the nerve out. Um, and once that IOP is relieved, the cupping kind of improves. Um, one thing to note that the RNFL damage that uh, occurs during the elevated IOP um, will not improve. And so again, if there's any RNFL damage, uh, that stays. Moving on to post-op month two, we see kind of a similar picture here. So again, the corneal thickness has not changed that much, and the intraocular pressure is approximately the same as well. Um, and this begs the question, you know, there's patients on full medical therapy still, they had a technically successful surgery, you know, what might be some of the factors as to why the IOP is still elevated? Um, could it be collector channel fibrosis, increased resistance in the episcleral venous outflow system? You know, we incise the, uh, uh, the Schlem's canal and there can be some heme, but oftentimes there is heme. Um, could the heme be blocking the uh, collector channels? We also place the patient on, you know, steroids and could there be a steroid induced IOP spike initially? Um, so in cases like this, definitive treatment uh, may be a trabecular bypass surgery, but this begs the question kind of what do we do to monitor the progression? When do we know to jump to do a, a more definitive surgery if need be? Well, the key exam findings that we wanna follow here are things like refraction. So again, these patients tend to be myopic and we look to the progression of myopia, um, the corneal diameter, the corneal thickness, and the axial length. And typically if the IOP is elevate, elevated, but these key exam findings are staying stable su throughout subsequent exams and vision is improving, or at least there's no amblyopia that's occurring, you typically try to not jump to another surgery just yet. Now, if any of these findings are progressing throughout your subsequent exams, then it's important to intervene earlier rather than later. Um, and again, we don't, again, the end goal is to prevent amblyopia. So one of the cool things that our parents, the parent was able to tell us, uh, mom and dad there, that um, the baby was actually able to see and uh, track his parents' faces. And they noted this to be a faster recovery than the older brother. So speaking about the older brother here, he's now a seven-year-old baby or seven-year-old boy. Um, and he presented to kids back in 2017, where he had some surgery done uh, in uh, their original country in Syria, which looked to be a 
approximately like trabeculectomies with large peripheral erdotomies. Now he's undergone a lot of subsequent surgeries after that. He's had some goniotomies, um, omaglocoma valves, as well as some needling and 5-FU injections. He most recently had a cataract that was extracted. But some of the things that I want to show here about the long-term sequelae is the corneal diameter is, again, quite large at 17 millimeters. And the axial length, again, is quite large as well, even for adult cases at 30 millimeters. Um, so this kind of touches on a little bit of the long-term sequelae that we see in uh, congenital glaucoma. Again, persistent corneal edema is not uncommon, and it does take time for the corneal edema to resolve. Um, keep in mind that this can result in IOP measurement issues. Uh, and one note I actually wanted to mention here as well too is crying babies equals elevated IOP. So getting accurate IOP measurements when the baby or the child is calm is the most important thing. That, that's gonna give you the most kind of accurate ideas of what's going on. Um, HABS 3A typically present late. And as I said, you know, uh, amblyopia again is the one thing that we wanna prevent. Deprivational amblyopia is a key thing that we wanna stop, especially in cases of persistent corneal edema. Now, in large axial lengths, obviously a, um, another downside of congenital glaucoma. And this has a whole sorry, host- Sorry, Yogi, can I just uh, say that as well? So hapstria are present, it's just that uh, you don't detect them during the time where the cornea is hazy. So you don't actually see it. If you look very carefully in a sedated child, you may actually be able to see those um, linear breaks in Desimé's membrane. Uh, within the very edematous cornea, but it may not be that obvious. So that's one of the things that we actually use um, to, to look and see whether this is a corneal dystrophy, whether it uh, compared to uh, glaucoma, and having the facility to actually look at a child in very calm in a sedated state, you may actually be able to detect hypsteria, but they're not obvious. They only become as obvious as you're showing in your picture there, when the um, corneal haze is cleared and the edema is cleared. And then you can actually see the tram lines uh, that you see. Okay, sorry. Awesome, thanks. Um, so yeah, so uh, exactly on, on that note as well too, um, kind of chatting about some of the axial length changes uh, too, you know, you get different, uh, you get uh, things such as uh, lens subluxation, stretch sonules, atrophic retinal changes, prefer retinal changes, and increased risk of retinal detachment. Um, and again, given the fact that there's uh, myopic shifts, often some, oftentimes you can get an azimotropic amblyopia, and these patients often require uh, lifelong management. So not just in their pediatric ages as well, but when they graduate to the adult world, uh, it's important that these patients are followed kind of lifelong as they may require multiple glaucoma surgeries. Um, so I know we're running a little bit short on time here, so um, I won't really go too much into this, but I just want to say, you know, really enjoy our time here at Sick Kids. Um, you know, you do see a, a lot of weird, wacky, wild things. Um, you run into a lot of interesting characters and stuff, but I think one of the weirdest things that still surprised a lot of people um, when I was a PGY3 there was, uh, you know, we had a, um, uh, I think a pediatrician give us a call about an eight-day-old whose mom thought she saw something moving around in the kiddo's eyes. Uh, and when they presented to Sick Kids, they actually came with these like, quite literally maggots in this poor little eight day old's eyes. Um, and so, you know, of course we called infectious disease and about eight physicians, including residents and med students ran down because they were all curious to be like, oh my gosh, and an eight day old, this doesn't make sense. Um, and so they came down and checked it out. We sent them off to micro and they actually were a housefly larvae. Um, and uh, the thought process is, you know, an eight day old keeps their eyes closed for the majority of time. Uh, and so this fly may have just laid some eggs in this little kiddo's eyes and you know they hatched into larvae and the mom actually found something moving around in the kid's eyes so you're still you know you'll still see kind of wild wacky things and things will make you squirm uh, when you come to sick kids but it's a lot of fun uh, and as i said you meet a lot of cool people and uh, it's a good time so thanks again thanks very much yoki and uh, that was uh, that was a good case to present and uh, the wacky things hopefully uh, the, the things that make you squirm do not include congenital glaucoma anymore. They are, uh, these cases are difficult to manage, but um, very rewarding when you actually see when somebody uh, turns up with completely white cornea and you can actually improve um, the outcome for them. And so the one important thing would be to see, hopefully that this kid does not develop nystagmus like his brother. And uh, his brother has got the largest corneas I, I think anybody's seen. I think they're about 17 millimeters in diameter and he's run a lot of, run into a lot of problems, but um, still, we've still managed to keep his uh, vision for him uh, to now. Uh, so I want to see if there are any other questions from the group or any sort of con contributions from 
the uh, other members. I'll just say the, there's also a psychosocial component to some of that, right? So if you have 17 millimeter corneas, I think that will clearly impact um, that, that child socially at school. Um, and so we, we definitely need to be cognizant of that. Matt Schlenker actually posted a video in the chat. Um, I haven't seen it yet just because we were here, but I did briefly click the link um, about endoscopic assisted transluminal trabeculectomy, so EAT instead of GAT. So uh, people in the audience may want to check that out as well. So I think, uh, you know, as a pediatric ophthalmologist, you get trained to do goniotomy and trabeculotomy. And uh, if, you, if, if you kind of, uh, want to kind of think about the long-term future for this child, your preference is to try and stick with the goniotomy as much as possible, because it means that you don't disturb the conjunctiva and the sclera for future care and future surgeries for this child. So I actually tried to do a goniotomy on this kid and I cleared the epithelium. I took the epithelium off to see if I could do an ab internal and on the better eye. And I thought, no, I, I can't see the angle. And I didn't think about doing uh, endoscopic assisted. Um, I had to get both eyes done. The kid was only about uh, a week or two old. And so not an awful lot of time in terms of um, uh, anesthesia time as well. We want to do both eyes in, in one sitting. Uh, and so we uh, opted to uh, go to um, ab external. Uh, and uh, so that's kind of faster, uh, I guess. The other thing is um, in these eyes with very large corneas and very little uh, scleral rigidity, the, um, the smaller number of openings that you can make into the eye, the better. Um, and so that's, that's, the, uh, that's the other point as well, but that's uh, very useful. Thank you very much. And we'll explore doing endoscopic assisted transluminal trabeculotomy. I think we, all of us are very excited in uh, doing ab internal surgery and uh, GAT surgery because it allows us to manage the whole angle in one sitting rather than multiple repeated goniotomies or trabeculotomies where we could only do a small uh, amount of the angle. I think those are great presentations. The, the one thing just for everyone, uh, as we know, uh, we try and get these kids in as early as possible. And I think that's the key, as Nasrin was saying, to get reasonable success. And so any kids with, a, often it's a funny red reflex, uh, sometimes it's, it's curing, but uh, we try and see them as quickly as possible, not put them off two or four weeks and uh, go forward. Uh, if you can see them that week or within a few days, it's a quick exam. And you can, if, if there is something going on there, you'll pick it up very quickly and they can be moved on and treated at a much earlier age and do much better. Thanks, Andrew. Yeah, you can always pick with that. And, and, and you can always pick up the phone and I'll either call to the resident on call or um, just ask the staff who's in clinic at the time and uh, we'll speak to anyone um, and usually accommodate and get you in. Perfect, thank you guys. And speaking of things that make you squirm at sick kids, it's usually finding a resident to do a refraction. So I wanna thank the sick kids staff for teaching our, our, our residents how to refract. Because uh, that is something that gets the juniors squirming very easily. Uh, I do want to thank uh, Mike and Yogesh and Dr. Tarani for the excellent presentations today. And next week's round will be a visiting professor, Dr. Saraf, uh, renowned retina specialist from, from LA. So please do join us for that. And I wish everyone a happy um, family day weekend. Thank you. Enjoy your day.